Hello, Harry here, and welcome or welcome back to another episode of Jog On. Thank you very much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. If you like what we're doing here with Jog On and want to help us a little bit, one thing you can do is hit subscribe, or even better, you can recommend us to someone who might also enjoy listening. If you want to get in contact, it's thisisjogon at gmail.com. On Instagram, we're at Jog On Podcast. And now, on to the episode. <laughs> Recently, I got an email. It was from an exercise physiologist who'd noticed Jog On and was interested in coming on to talk about some of his ideas. So I accepted and we set a date. The conversation that you're about to hear is with him. You've obviously got a podcast voice, which it helps. He's an incredibly knowledgeable person in his field, and it was really quite fascinating for me to discuss with him some of the more scientific details regarding running. You're more thinking about heavy and slow. So you're thinking more about two to four sets, four to ten heavy slow reps with two to three minutes recovery in between. We discuss the importance of interval training. I think if we train hard too often, intervals are like, oh dear. The benefits of paying attention to heart rate. They're fresh and ready to go and they can really light it up uh, because I want them to be able to light it up. And we even went a little more in depth on things such as acute to chronic workload. Sounds dramatic, but actually quite helpful information that Gavin explained fairly clearly. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was a pleasure to have him on. I learned a few things and I hope that you do too. So please, welcome to Jog On, Gavin McLean. How young were you when you started running? Are we going back like kid? So I really would have played a lot of football. And to be honest, I wasn't very good. And <laughs> <laughs> could run a lot, uh, surprisingly enough. But mm. I was technically pretty terrible. But I tried to apply ultimately what I knew from a sports science setting to that to help improve. And then during my undergraduate, once I was at Liverpool, I started going to the gym a lot more because then I could apply it quite directly. I could see the results there, just applying what I knew. And I could see big results and get a big reward because I knew what, well, I ultimately knew what I was doing by just applying the science and mm. did that for a while. It was good. It was fun. But then there's also that element of, okay, that'll only go so far. What about running? And I always kind of liked running. And I ultimately did kind of fall into it as a bit part of a rehab from a label tire. I was very much like a couch to 5k runner to this at the start. That yeah. was like 2016, really. Senior rewards from applying what I knew. How can that really benefit me with little to no talent, really, to be honest, no talent at all, and just get that reward. And it was just exciting to me because I know it's a bit geeky, but it's exciting because then you're getting to apply what you know and you're seeing that reward benefit. Oh, 100%, and yeah. And then that's kind of where led me to Naughty, really, where ultimately where I get to help other people and I want to help other people. I know I can make a difference. That's quite a strong image, actually, you in the gym. And I completely know what you mean. It has got that kind of geek feel about it, but there's something quite satisfying about that, about you've actually got this knowledge almost like being by the bench press with a calculator making uh sort of working out the best way to do it and applying that science and i've always been someone that's you know done everything by feel whether it be the running or the gym and it's only more recently i've become a bit more interested in the whole idea of actually looking at articles and researching a bit and being like well hang on is there some some method to this i could start to apply because as you uh, i heard you mention in an, another episode um on the not another runner podcast which is a, a fascinating chat anyway but you mentioned about how a lot of people run by feel feel and that can be fantastic because we do have a good understanding of our own bodies but sometimes it's surprising how much you can your own brain can trick you and sometimes you can be pushing harder than you ever realized and actually using things like heart rate and stuff um can be a little more methodical in your approach so i can i can understand what you're saying there yeah for sure i think that one's like quite a common one that's really if i even go by feel i know i'll make a mistake i'll be training harder than i feel like i've tested it myself just to go you know i train with heart rate monitor all the time Let's just see what happens if I can not program anything. If you like beeper alerts, for instance, I'll have on the watch. So I'll not program it. Just go go by complete feel. It tends to drag up a little bit more. It goes into a little bit harder than I perceive. And when we can use knowledge like that, I think it's a great opportunity to use it. And I think, why not? So you mentioned that it wasn't a complete fresh jumping into the deep end with running. You had some experience. You already knew you'd had um, a little bit of an ability there. Like you say yourself, it's, a, it's always great. I think for people to hear someone say, look, I'm not a talented person. I wouldn't consider myself someone. And especially on this episode, to be honest, I've had some people who have just clearly like, you know, they don't train and they'll just go and run an 18 minute 5k because that's how they naturally do. They just have this amazing talent. So it's always nice to hear from someone who doesn't necessarily have that foundation or doesn't certainly consider themselves to be necessarily have any crazy abilities, but they've been able to apply some science and methodically get better. Because I think for people that 
they realize, well, hang on, that, that might be me as well. Like I've got some potential. I think someone like you is quite appealing in that way. There is an element sometimes of people who are in a spotlight being a, a 14 minute 5k runner and there becomes a, a kind of a ceiling to the point where it's almost just becomes unrelatable. I guess I, I'm sort of vaguely lucky that I'm, I'm not that fast really at the end of the day. So maybe that's why um, some people will actually be like, okay, I'll, I'll listen to a bit of what he's saying because... <laughs> He's not like a lightning fast freak. Was it quite a, a fast transition where you sort of uh, finished with the football? I mean, to keep it kept it up as long as you did, even though you weren't necessarily that good at it. You used to talk about having two left feet. Um, I was very similar. You must have enjoyed football and, and sort of still got something from it. Oh, yeah, it was so good. Like, I enjoyed that team bit. I had really good mates, um, really good. Like, I played it right from, like, a kid, really. Um, wow, yeah. The main bit was I enjoyed the competitiveness and I enjoyed winning. I was always very aware that I was more... I could run further and more people like I could keep on going and I was always kind of aware that I was okay at running so maybe and then naturally I just kind of fell into it afterwards. What distance have you found that you have the most ability at? Are you a sort of a, a 510k or have you found quite some success at half and, and marathon? Where are you sitting? Uh, so I haven't run a marathon just yet. I'm building up for one. I'll probably be more comfortable at half marathon to be honest. Definitely not rapid enough for a 5k. Yeah, I reckon more about half marathon seems to be about right for me. So you start this thing called Running Smarter. How does that for you, Gavin, begin? You always had this idea bubbling away at the back that you wanted to do something to help people. So I was doing my PhD in sports cardiology, um, but I did my undergraduate in sport and exercise science. And I always wanted to use that knowledge and use it not only me, like because I've seen the results of me, but to help others. So I always had that burning desire, right? There's going to be no better opportunity than now to do it. So let's do it now. Otherwise, you're never going to do it. Um, and that's where I came from. And I think that is the natural progression. You've had your own sort of gym geeky moments where you think, yes, this is actually working. I'm applying the science to my own performance. I think that next level is, well, I might as well help other people because you must see people out there. You know, there's lots of us floundering around, just sort of going, should I do a 5K today? I don't know. I feel like it. Oh dear, I blew up at 3K and there's, there's no there's no real uh, sense behind it. And I think sometimes people look for that thing to anchor them down. You know, it's why we consume podcasts and we read Wikipedia articles. We, I think most people are pretty hungry for knowledge. If you find something that you're interested in, you're going to want to learn more about it. Absolutely. I think part of the, the tricky thing is still being at a GCSE level when you feel like an adult, even though you're only a teenager, and still being forced <laughs> to study math. And if math is not your thing, then you don't want to be there and you still have to learn math. And it's horrendous. And I suppose even now, I probably don't go work and start researching math. So at no point in my life am I going to become uh, all of us an interest in that subject. You're right. In a way, I wish I could have specialized earlier. And wouldn't it be amazing if uh, schools actually offered running as one of the your A levels? That would be too bad with it, though. That would be all right. I would have tried to take it three times. Amazing. So you mentioned the max heart rate test in very simplistic terms, jacking the heart rate right up to that, that high level. The general uh, idea behind it is that as you get a bit older, that max heart rate number comes down. You mentioned very briefly the whole 220 minus age. Um, for people that don't know, that's uh, taking the number 220 and then taking away your current age to give you a rough idea. And I've heard you mention before that that can work, but it's a bit more of an individual basis. And actually, that isn't necessarily always accurate. It works on a sort of a general level, population level, but just for the individual like you. You personally, for example, you might find that actually that doesn't work for you. Um, is that a, a fair comment? Yeah, I would completely agree. I would say like population level is pretty poor, um, but then when you go an individual, it's it's yeah definitely not great. Um, and that will even vary on sports, to be honest. That will vary. So let's say you're a triathlete, you'll have a different max heart rate if you for swimming, cycling, and running. And really, you want to determine if you're a triathlete the max heart rate for each one of those, and you can categorize those heart rate zones. We all know that we kind of do that from certain percentages of that max heart rate. Yeah, ultimately it's incredibly important. So for instance, um, like I did a quick social media where I basically asked, okay, can you self, what's your self-reported max heart rate what, for the last year and what's your age? And the vast majority of them were quite far out. I think it was as many as 5% were 20 beats out from that max heart rate. So wow. if you think about that in terms of apply that to your heart rate zones, that can really misguide you. you out quite a bit, yeah. I think the best way to describe it is kind of like, Okay, let's say I blindfolded you and let's say bring us back to football or me or football or you. We're both born with left feet, so we're still not in a good we're not in a good position to begin with here. Let's say I blindfold ourselves and then we try and shoot against the goal. Ultimately what will happen is we'll rarely hit the goal and we'll hit the wall sometimes and we'll probably smash the windows in the process. So that's what's kinda of like two twenty minutes your age is like ultimately. 
So I encourage you to really determine that real max heart rate. Yeah, it seems to be a key part of understanding um, where you're at. And like you say, uh, interesting to hear that that will sort of knock out where the, the heart rate zones are. And I think that probably leads us into the idea of that slightly more general discussion around what a week or even that sort of four week training block looks like regarding the intensity throughout, which will lead us to, to a conversation about interval training, which is something fascinating I want to get your opinion on. A big idea out there, it seems, is this idea. There's something called 80-20, which um, I thought you could probably talk us through uh, regarding actually it's starting to seem more like maybe the majority of our training shouldn't be quite as intense as perhaps we once thought. The old school method, as you well know, is really just to, this is my run, I'm going to make sure I do it and do it really well. And that translated to running hard and fast. And people putting in a lot of hard tempo runs, for a long time there's been the idea of the long, slow Sunday run, but perhaps the slightly easier pace running at the speed of chat runs could be implemented more regularly throughout a training plan. Could you just explain uh, to people who don't know what 80-20 training is and sort of the philosophy behind it? Yeah, so a lot of, uh, some people might have read the Twenty 20 book um, it's a pretty it's a pretty good book in terms of it breaks things down into that nice conversational tone but where this really comes from is a lot of uh, work from professor Stephen Seiler he is an American physiologist based in Norway a lot of his work is based on this and he's um, seen this up and ultimately looking where he's not really even opposed interventions because the athletes have kind of self-selected this over the years and find out what's worked mm. and whether it's running whether it's cycling whether it's cross-country skiers, there's lots of cross-country skiers in Norway, as you'd, you'd expect. Yeah, um, 80-20 appears to work best, and that's where the biggest benefits come from. 80-20 really is, so we've got that max heart rate, and then we categorize our heart rate zones. Now, I like to think of things in a free zone model. I know, for instance, a Garmin will give you a five, but free is quite simplistic, and, and it's easy to understand, and it's also based on physiological landmarks. So green, yellow, red, what seems to work best is 80% green and 20% really red. And nothing really sucked into the middle. Um, Interesting. But 80 20, roughly, if you look at it purely session design. So let's say you have five sessions next week, four of those sessions in the green, one of those in the red. But if you look in time and zone, it'll change a little bit. Um, so if you actually looked at time collected minutes, it'll be more like 90 10. Why, I guess, would be the question is why, why do you want to spend all this time in the green? Why are you mm. going to get benefit from, from doing it? That's exactly the question people will tend to have, yeah. Yeah, so why not spend all that time in the yellow like it's more close to your race pace? So do you not want to maximize every single session you have so therefore run close to that race pace? The thing is, if you're running in the yellow zone, you're above that lactate threshold, so it's, it's more fatiguing. So therefore, it makes it hard to sustain over the rest of the week. Whereas if you go grains of work, you can collect a lot more minutes. We know that's associated with raise in your ceilings, your VO2 max, which is we know is important. So... By doing that, it's going to be more sustainable and heck, it's going to be more enjoyable and will lead to probably less people dropping out of our sport because they'll enjoy the process a little bit more, I think, in terms of that conversational tone, if we want to call it. Mm. Relating that back to the brief discussion on heart rate zones, the heart rate training brings in a really solid way of actually knowing right now I'm in green and right now I'm in red, as opposed to just, oh, I feel like this is kind of a green kind of pace. Oh, now I feel like I'm really pushing it kind of judging way. So that's where heart rate sort of applies and becomes quite accurate in, in getting those zones correct. Yeah, it's really important to determine that objectively. Like, for instance, I've done it myself and I really have been quite far out when not relying on heart rate um, and going out myself and just trialing it really is important. We have available the smart watches and the chest heart rate monitor straps. If you want to use the chest heart rate monitor strap, you don't want to use the heart rate derived from your watch. It can be really quite mm -hmm. inaccurate. It's going to be, what, 60 quid. But that, that'll last like 10 years. The only thing you really need to do is just change your battery, which costs quid. So it's a good investment to me. You pretty much uh, hit the nail on the head then with the final question I was going to ask you on heart rate monitors is exactly that. It seems to be the consensus is chest strap is more accurate. The wrist watch, as shown by people even demonstrating online, can be wildly out. It's just not as accurate as chest strap. And exactly that, someone can get one for a cheap price. But you pretty much that was going to be my question and you already answered it. So that summarizes the, the heart rate. So I think one of the interesting subjects, and there's some general understanding about this. The key word here is, is intervals, interval training, um, high intensity 
the interval training if you want to give it the, the, the full broader term and it's something I know that you've spoken about before something that you're quite interested in and I wanted to pick your brain a little bit more on it could you talk through a little bit about interval training uh, you know what that looks like so now we're kind of um, I guess talking about certain sections in that red zone and for you when you're tailoring these training plans for someone that comes to you as a client very roughly for a beginner how many times a week are you putting this in per month how often is, is someone interval training in a and what looks like a healthy training plan um if we're working on a seven day cycle which is typically what most runners will work on once a week because i'll fit in with like 80 20 and that means that they're fresh and ready to go and they can really light it up because uh, i want them to be able to light it up when they when they're doing intervals and to be excited about intervals i think if we train hard too often intervals are like oh dear whereas if you're like the low minutes in the green zone like we kind of touched on before then you're ready and like excited to really light it up uh, so i would say once a week in short mm. I love that term, light it up. It is something that, I mean, for me, interval sessions, I know when I'm uh, feeling fresh and I bounce through them and they feel great, but there are other times if you've got you've got that yeah. feeling of, oh my gosh, I've got to go push this. Perhaps you are a little little overtrained or a little bit wearisome and maybe you've gone a little too hard too soon in the week for that, what needs to be your, your real effort. So in terms of um, breaking it down for someone who has done very little interval training, which I think there are a lot of runners out there who do just go out and they'll run 10 miles, they get back and that's it. I've always sort of called it one gear training they don't really jump um per se. i talked about it at the start of the most recent video with running it's easy to get caught up in one gear but if you want to improve that race time you can help your chances by doing repetitions uphill quickly this video is hopefully a good example of one of these sessions trying not to stay in one gear and having other gears available to you which i would argue is possibly what interval training allows and opening up a little bit in terms of that pace how do you sort of start to break down whether someone's going to be doing 250 meter lengths uh, 400 meter you know one kilometer reps what, what looks good from your end i think as runners we often fixate on distance and i understand it because we work in a distance game but i tend to think in time and the reason i think about it in time is an 800 rep for you is going to be different for me and you're going to cover it in a different time than me and I'm thinking about time because I'm thinking about, I want to know, I want to collect, you to collect so many minutes in that red zone or increase the pace that you can sustain in that red zone. Mm. So that's why I'm always thinking about time. And we know that's really key as well would be, you've got to do something that's longer than a minute, somewhere really more than two minutes. If you want to get in that VO2 max and around the red zone. So working in around that VO2 max, that's ultimately what tends to be the goal for an interval session with somebody I'm working for, trying to raise their ceiling, raise their VO2 max. In short, yeah, I'd be thinking more about times. So somewhere in around two minutes or more, tends to be starting three minutes. And then that might build up how many reps they do, it might build up the speed that they're sustaining in around their VO2 max. It all depends on that given block, where they are right now and how you progress it up. So that could begin with three minutes on, two minutes off, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's an interesting way to, to work. I remember at university, um, winter evenings out on this big grass field and there was a guy in the middle with a whistle and he would literally blow it and you'd sort of go hard for three minutes and you'd blow it again and you'd jog for a minute and then go again and those are some of the hardest sessions and because there's other people around you so you're trying to compete a little bit there were a lot of people by the end gasping on their knees at the end of those kind of sessions and it was the same thing it was all based off time as like you say time has some science behind it yeah the distance i guess is just attractive because then you've got that clear carrot at the end ultimately the reward is if you do an 800 meter a little bit faster it's done faster uh, whereas the three bits, so let's say it's three minutes, no matter what speed you run at, it's going to last three minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so then the challenge is to run a lot further within that three minutes at a faster speed. I want to ask you in regards to intervals, if you looked at my training plan, there's two sort of significant differences. And one is flat intervals where I'm pushing hard for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of distance on the flat. And then I also have hills. Um, mm -hmm. Do you play around much with hills? Do you tend to keep it quite flat? I guess you with your client depends on what they've got geographically. Have you got any kind of opinion on hills versus flat? Depends on the goal, like what they're training for. Um, I'll caveat it to that and say, look, if they're training for, let's say, a road run, it'll generally speak be quite flat. So therefore, I would be generally speaking encouraging to work on the flat. And the reason I tend to encourage the flat, there has been some studies which shown that you can reach a higher VO2 if you're on the flat. Um, why that is, I don't have a scooby. Um, it could be just because you're 
you're running for longer and therefore mm. that'll climb and climb and then maybe you're spending more minutes and around your VO2 max. But let's say if you're if you're a marathon or you're a half marathon or wherever you're training for it's got hills in it, yeah, it's probably a good idea to incorporate some hills in there for sure. I always remember I used to train with a, a good friend of mine. I remember he when we used to do a session together in hills, he'd always wanted to run up the steepest hill possible. And I'd always sort of gone with the mindset of if I am gonna do hills, I'll do sort of more like a, a gradual incline as opposed to something that's, you know, straight up in the air because there's just a limit to how hard you can work. You know, your legs just can't pull up that hill. It's something that's been quite interesting to me. I've certainly found that recently in particular, I've been able to, just because of the sheer pace you can get on the flat, that I really am jacking that heart rate up. So probably about sort of 60 to 70 percent of all my interval training is probably flat and then about 30 percent up on on a hill i think it's just really down to like so let's say it's that really sharp incline okay that's probably going to be a shorter interval and if you think about how heart rate responds it's quite a delayed response it takes a while to get up there mm. um and you compare your peak heart rate in the first interval versus your last interval it's going to be higher in the last and we know heart rate's very related to the vo2 in terms of the air you're breathing etc so working in around your vo2 max that's where i think the maybe more of a gradual incline like you've started incorporating or the flat maybe more beneficial in terms of allowing you to collect more minutes in around that VO2 max. Absolutely. That sustaining thing is, seems to be quite a quite a big thing these days. Um, I wondered if you could just give a very brief summary of something called acute to chronic workload. It's something I had a very brief look into and it's the kind of thing that can screw your head a little bit. Have you got a fairly simple explanation to anyone listening of what acute to chronic workload is and how someone can incorporate that into their training? Yeah, I'll try to explain it simply, um, but if it's not <laughs> simply, uh, ask questions and call me out if it's not broken down well. It's very much derived from the work of uh, Tim Gabbett, strength physiologist, okay? And he's applied us in multiple different sports and you've seen really good results from this. And what is it in short is chronic workload is what you're prepared for. Acute is what you plan to do. And a nice way to think about it is in distance. There is a limitation to this and I'll explain after, but let's think about just distance right now because it's nice. We can use some simple maths here. So let's say rolling average for the last four weeks to your chronic is 40K per week, rolling average. You plan to do next week 50. So you divide 50 by 40, and that'll give you a sum of 1.25. Correct me if my mouse is wrong, please. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Definitely in don't sweet... ask me. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Right, it puts you in a sweet spot. A sweet spot of someone in between 0.8 to 1.3. And that's where we think, okay, you're going to see physiological benefit from training, but you're going to have that reduced risk of injury, reduced risk of overtraining syndrome. Now, if you get something above 1.5, that's where we would call the red zone, the danger zone. And that's where we would see a really increased risk of injury and you don't want to be in around there. So you want to keep it in between 0.8 to 1.3. So 0.8 dropping down, maybe recovery week, something like that. But up towards 1.3 once you're pushing up in terms of progressions. And that's the new scientific technique with it as opposed to the classic 10% rule, which we're probably all a little bit familiar with. Mm. The 10% rule has its limitations. Just say, for example, um, let's use distance again because it's easy to use in terms of mass. Uh, but let's say you ran 10K last week and your goal is to move that up to 20K. You applied a 10% rule after seven weeks, you're still not there. So that's just a nice example in terms of a limitation of it. Understood. So it's simply, it's again, it's this whole approaching things methodically, with, even with some statistics and uh, even a little bit, dare I say it, mathematics to back it up of if you're increasing how much you're doing, whether that be mileage or whatever workload, um, it's a way of actually getting the right number to make sure you're not increasing by too much i've mm -hmm. definitely in the past had a thing where i've gone like oh my training's going terribly i'm just going to whack on an extra 10k this next week and uh it's just yeah like you say it's not it's not a good way to work so yeah thanks for explaining that that makes a lot of sense and i think it's uh something that's really interesting um for people to pay attention to i will just caveat that can i yeah yeah go for it go for it just because if you look at it just in distance there is the issue of Okay, if you ran a 10K at seven, six minute K per pace, or you ran it at four minute K per pace, you're talking about a completely different session. So there's you'll neglect just training intensity if you forget it. So that's why I, for instance, will use a platform, an online platform that'll just calculate it into one neat score. So I'll take into consideration time in zone, so training intensity, and also time on feet, so how long they've been running for. That is, it's important to do that because if you you could, if you should, like for example, like I said, if you were just to completely ignore um, intensity, you could be completely playing within the metrics if you think about a distance, but in actual fact, you're really overreaching and really going to increase that risk of risk of injury and also that overtraining syndrome as well. Yeah, 
it's fascinating because this is stuff that you know most people barely pay any attention to um that's why runners sort of come along with that stereotype um however true it is which probably isn't the truth is quite true is that sort of injury coming alongside running and it's things like this where you know people are paying very little attention to it where people probably could get a little more knowledgeable on certain subjects and maybe avoid and sort of run a bit more stronger and healthier and as the title says a bit more smarter um which is why it's so appropriately named and one of the final things on interval training is something that you've mentioned before i think it was in a, a blog you talked about it that there is that slight misconception that once you start doing long distances marathon above even half marathon plus that speed work is not something that you need to do because you're not gonna be running that fast and it's just all about endurance but i think it's fair to say you would possibly uh counter that and say no there is still a place for some interval training even if you are training for a, a longer distance yeah, so we're probably thinking about something like speed reserve and really short sharp efforts um, yeah, there would be still a space and time for it. Like right now is a good time. If you're, if you're, if you're going to apply it, now is a good time in light of race performance and what have you, because it allows you to work at that really top end speed. And by working at that really top end speed, basically you're going to increase your, your ability to apply force to the ground. So if you can apply more force to the ground, you're going to have developed tendons. You're going to get better neuromuscular signaling. Okay, what does this all lead to improvement in? Improve running economy. So how much oxygen it costs you to do what you're trying to do. Mm. So that's little one or two blocks of it right now. If you're going to anytime going to do it, would be appropriate to do it now. That's where I would say it'd be a time and place to do it. That's fascinating. It's, it's, I think it's very refreshing to hear someone actually give some hard science rather than just talking about running experiences and actually talk about ground force reaction and just how hard you're kicking off on that ground and how that actually applies. You briefly a couple of times have touched on those famous words of strength and conditioning, something that some runners completely avoid. Some people absolutely love to incorporate it into their training plan. I know you've referenced sort of potentially around sort of two times a week, but I'm guessing again, it's an individual basis as to yeah. where that kind of line sits for someone who is trying to juggle, well, hang on, am I meant to be doing conditioning sessions every other day? Am I just throwing a couple in? What for you, again, a little bit like interval training, what does uh, a good amount of strength and conditioning look like? It's difficult to manage because we were, if we, took, we kind of talked about it in terms of too much of it ultimately and trying to manage that time and then ultimately you know, the most benefit you're going to get is from running and then juggling all of our different commitments. So how do we fit it in? I would say really twice a week seems to be appropriate. Some runners will be able to do it more, but it really depends on the availability. But when we think about how much time you have available and the rewards of extra running and extra strength conditioning work, but twice a week seems to be appropriate. And then it's a case of when do you do it in the week? Let's say, okay, we're targeting, we're targeting our legs. It's probably not a good idea to do it in the morning of or the day preceding a hit session. You want them legs to be fresh and ready to go or the day preceding or the day of a long run because you need them legs to carry you through. So maybe the day after is quite a good time to do it when the legs are probably a little bit, maybe let's say they're battered up a little bit. Let's just use an old Irish phrase. And I think where a lot of runners can maybe make a little mistake here is, okay, I'm really time pressed. So let's combine both sessions together let's do a run and then i'll just come home and i'll do my snc work straight away what you've done there is just turn that into an epic endurance session which right. you don't really want to do you want to turn it into strength conditioning where you're really working on strength not endurance because that's not what you need as a runner you need to work on your yeah ultimately your strength and your power as a runner and one of the things that you discussed briefly is there is again this kind of slight culture when people do touch on running and strength conditioning of sort of doing lower weight and higher rep but um, perhaps the science doesn't necessarily dictate that that is of any benefit what you really want to do is just genuinely build strength so low rep is okay yeah so it's kind of like the logic would be okay right the demands of my sport is that i run continuously at one given speed really and i try and sustain that speed for as long as possible the faster speed I can sustain over a given time for a longer period of time, the better I can perform. Okay. So then I go, okay, right. Maybe if I just do mimic those demands in terms of strength and condition, that'd be most appropriate. But in actual fact, you're already getting such an endurance development from doing that repetitively and running. The best development you're going to get is actually developing your power and developing your strength, the things you aren't really doing all the time in the running side of things. So that means not like the circuit type of training that we might do those classes, gym classes and stuff where we get at the gym. More or like your 20 minute hit workout. You're more thinking about like do as many reps as possible. You're more thinking about heavy and slow. So you're thinking more about two to four sets, four to 10 heavy, slow reps with two to three minutes recovery in between. 
that's where you're kind of thinking. And then the next question really is, what do I need to target? What, what do I need to develop as a runner? You're more think, you're thinking around your thigh and your calf muscle. I think we all think runners, the misconception is, oh, I need it. It's all in the butt. It's all in the glute. Mm. Uh, but in actual fact, your calves absorb about 50% of that torque when you're running. Uh, so you really want to target them. Yeah. You use the word evidence a few times on your website, and I think that's quite a, a big part of it is actually just looking at, at studies and what helps. An example of something that I found quite interesting is this concept of running form. If it's improving, quite often it's improving effectively in the subconscious. And by that, that means just generally upping your mileage. You actually referenced a, a study. I wonder if you could just briefly explain that to people listening where people over a certain period of time had actually improved by a, a percentage in terms of their running economy. They'd naturally made little adaptations with without even realizing it. Yeah, so I'll, I won't be able to quote you the exact percentages off the top of my head, but ultimately uh, what they did is they got a group of complete novice runners, all right? And they had a physiologist like me, they had biomechanics specialists, so they're, they're really smart people that can look at all the, how you're running, the different technique and pit like bulbs on you and stuff, they're, they're different level of genius, okay? So what they did is they got these individuals, got them running a treadmill at a certain speed, put a mask on them so the physiologist measuring the air to breathe in air, air to breathe out and that allows us to determine running economy but also the biomechanics individual looked at them okay how are they running from a technique perspective in terms of our textbook classic gold standard technique they got them to follow a training plan and with no instruction whatsoever in terms of running form they improved the running economy so then you think ah oh, they've just improved the running economy there because they've trained more but they actually, from looking at the biomechanics analysis, they were actually improving their technique just subconsciously uh, without realizing it. Just mm. somewhat, there's a large degree of self-optimization when it comes to running form. I mean, the more you look into it, the more amazing the human body is. And this self-optimization, such a great mm. term, it's it's amazing what can happen in, in the subconscious and your body just, so I did CrossFit for a few years and whilst I was running and I remember the way my hand used to harden up and it just formed calluses and it was just this thing and people would be like, oh, my calluses today and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people would get crazy, chalky, horrible hands from all these pull-ups and gripping the bar and all this kind of stuff and but actually when you really think about it it's like no your hand was literally adapting and forming harder pads so that it would be more comfortable yeah. in the future and you could have a tougher i mean like we just kind of throw these terms around but when you look at it you're like this is amazing the way this thing adapts and and does these things so the moment i heard that thing about form forms always something that's fascinating me anyway but it was interesting to hear you talk about yeah those those the things that's happening on that deeper level where you're self-optimizing and your body's just making adaptations to make this this whole thing we call running a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more economic one of the final things I wanted to touch on, Gavin, was running smarter itself. Obviously, there's you, there must be it must be quite rewarding and quite satisfying, and you're going to have many more experiences like this as you go through of helping people and, and seeing them make their own improvements and their own sort of light bulb moments. So far since September, have there been any moments or any particularly proud things where you have had a client or someone who's got a PB or had a real moment that's that's made the whole thing kind of worth it? Yeah, I think that's the that's the great fun bit aspect of it, really, because you like invested that personal time into somebody, and that's a good fun about doing bespoke plans and working with that person quite closely. So then, once they get that reward, you're so personally invested in them, and once you see that reward, that's really cool. So I think a good one recently, probably was a really recent one, was a girl called Ariel I worked with, and she's based in Chicago. She started work with me around February, early February time. Fair well, like she ran a some half marathons etc uh, the immediate goal was to run um, her first marathon in early june so seattle rock and roll and then she just wanted to run it and then she also had an in, has an entry into chicago later in the year but she wants to run in chicago later in the year she wants to run a sub four hour marathon okay hmm. cool thing there is okay race got cancelled so of course since we were in like pandemic and what have you um so she decided i'm gonna run a bridge i'm gonna run a marathon virtually because i've committed a trip in the training and i was like happy days cool might as well yeah yeah um and very cool like first ever marathon she's just gonna do it all of her and back it's pretty awesome so i was really pretty beaming with her because i didn't even have to push her in that direction so it was very cool so she's basically run full marathon off it just with a camel back etc uh <laughs> the cool thing is she ran the whole marathon so achieved Goal one, and uh, she smashed her sub four hour target uh, four months early. She ran it in three hours and forty eight minutes. Wow! So that was a that was a 
pretty good feeling after that. That's been a good day for her as well. Like, what an amazing thing. And to have done it by, I mean, what self-confidence that would give you. Like you did it by yourself. You didn't even need the race. So now like when the race come, finally comes back and she can have a go at it, who knows what she could do. That's, yeah, that's a four months early as well. Yeah, um, which is cool. And I think there's an element of that when it comes to someone being your client, I think after... For some people, it's been years of just trying to self-motivate and do, and at some point it might be quite nice, just follow these guidelines and we'll adjust accordingly. Absolutely incredible. And it must be so worthwhile when you have those moments to not only from those moments where you were in the gym, you know, using your own science and then applying it and seeing how things work, but to then have helped someone else do that, you know, it's as much as it's a career opportunity and fantastic, just on a personal level, it must be um a very satisfying and rewarding thing to be doing yeah no it is huge i would argue that satisfaction i would tend to find it bigger uh when it's somebody else i don't know why but i certainly feel like an emotion of satisfaction bigger once i i've been able to have a really good positive change on them amazing one of the very last things gavin i was just interested in your own personal journey have you got any particular goals yourself coming up regarding any races you want to do do you want to make your way towards that marathon distance what what does the next few years look like for you do you think so i've been nudging towards uh sub 120 half marathon so i want to get that done i'm like i've got 122 but long-term real long-term goal is uh qualified for boston so that's a sub three hour marathon but i'd be excited to continue to push on and develop into that into 2020 well gavin it's been brilliant to talk to you i think that certainly in the future if you'd be happy to i'd definitely have you on for another episode because there's so many other subjects we could talk about today we just skimmed over a a couple of bits regarding interval training and and heart rate and a few other facets i'm sure there's many more things we could talk about and certainly in a few more months time i'd love to have you back on final thing really gavin was just if someone's interested in knowing a bit more or getting in contact with you or booking a consultation or anything what's the best way to get in contact with you so they can follow me on running underscore smarter on instagram i put a lot of uh, free content on there so you can get a lot of free advice in terms of which i'm proud to do because i want to give you give people value in terms of who's following me but yeah also um if you're in, interested in more working with me and stuff so you can uh, i offer a free 30 minute consultation which you can book at running smarter.co.uk slash kickstart you can ask me anything and everything related to running um and i can give you specific advice and if you're interested in working with me then we can we can work with each other if not that's fine as well brilliant well Gavin, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I wish you all the best with the Running Smarter itself. So Gavin, I look forward to having you on again sometime. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks very much for having me on. It's been awesome. Um, And yeah, I would love to be a guest on your podcast sometime again in the future. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Jog On. I hope that you got something from it. If you want to do Jog On a favor, if you enjoy what we're doing, you can hit subscribe or even better, you can recommend us to a friend. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Have a go at applying a little more science to your running and see how you get along. Go for that run. I'm Harry and this is Jog On. (laughs) 